Good day, everyone. My name is Rebecca Blumenstein, and I'm the Deputy Editor-in-Chief of the Wall Street Journal uh, from New York. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today and to introduce my distinguished panel. We're here to talk about the disruptive trends that are transforming finance, and particularly digital disruption. Uh, first, on my right, I'd like to introduce uh, Calvin Chin. He's co-founder and CEO of Transit here in China and has been investing in digital uh, disruptors in the finance sector and beyond. Um, Bunty Bora, who heads uh, Goldman Sachs' operations in Bangalore, comes to us from there. Um, Alan Rice, who is CEO for SWIFT, based in Singapore, and heads up EMEA and Asia Pack for SWIFT, which handles a stunning 50 to 60 million transactions every day. Oki Masamoto, chairman and chief executive of Monex Group from Japan, and you were one of the youngest partners ever named at Goldman Sachs at age 30. Uh, 20 years ago, I read in your bio, which is quite you, impressive. You're talking about the past. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, last but not least, um, V.S. Parthas Sarathi comes to us from India, um, where he's head of IT and CEO of Mahindra and Mahindra, which contains no less than 18 separate companies, I'm told. And obviously, India is going through a very interesting time now with a new prime minister. Before we get started, um, I wanted to just ask you, the audience, a couple of questions to get a sense of where you stand in uh, the digital disruption chain. How many of you have done, mobile, have done banking on your mobile phone? Could you please raise your hands if any of you have used a mobile phone for banking? Can, can we as well? <laughs> That's pretty, that's pretty impressive. Now, um, pay is much in the air after the Apple announcement um, today that they're moving into the pay sector. How many of you have actually used a digital wallet uh, in your transactions? Okay, that's interesting. So far, fewer people have used uh, digital wallets. Uh, well, I'd like to open it up uh, to our panelists. Um, where do you think uh, digital disruption stands from your perch uh, in, in finance? Uh, Calvin, what do you see in China? Uh, we have a, a lot of incumbent banks. We have Alibaba growing very fast. Uh, is, is this something that's, that's gaining momentum in China? Oh, absolutely. I think uh, disruption in finance, uh, if we can think of emerging markets as a ripe uh, location for leapfrogging and not having legacy infrastructure or technologies, legacy consumer behaviors, I think you see China as a case in point where New technologies, new business models can emerge quickly and rapidly uh, and uh, explode into the new consumer behaviors and create business models and opportunities for all kinds of new and existing market players. I think I would say just kind of in a word, what I think maybe as a framework makes China particularly interesting is a large scale market mm -hmm. with receptive consumers, tremendous mobile and internet penetration, so the infrastructure and telecommunications infrastructure in place. I would say um, regulatory openness, um, despite some of the strictures in traditional finance, you can see characterized by online payments and how that market has developed over time. I know Elena has more to say about that. Mm. But also if you see now bank licensing to Tencent and Alibaba and these uh, and, uh, <coughs> dominant players in other sectors and other parts of uh, consumer interactions with commerce. I think uh, we're seeing tremendously exciting new developments where Chinese consumers are quickly and, rap uh, and, and easily using their phones now, using WeChat or an instant messenger client mm -hmm. to buy goods, to order food, to pay for the transportation in a taxi. All very new and exciting things that I don't think we see even in Silicon Valley or in the US. Mm -hmm. Bunty, what's the reality of, of all of this di digital innovation on the ground? Sometimes it sounds a little bit easier than it actually is in yeah. reality. Yeah, I, look, there, there are some big macro observations I would just make, and then I'll give one more graphic uh, you know, uh, metaphor for this. Uh, finance, at, uh, in, in the wholesale sense, is an in, in intermediation business, and financial intermediation has existed for thousands of years. I mean, it's one of the oldest professions, if you will. Um, and the big, big... A disruptive element of technology is that disintermediation where you know people can directly access what otherwise used to be their privity in terms of information or in terms of capital or resources and so it's a huge democratizing force but if you if you took away the context of this technology uplift if you just looked at the core finance 
business lines or activities, they're going through their own generational change, notwithstanding all the technological disruption. We're going through probably one of the largest upregulations of the ecosystem in you know, seven or eight decades, uh, certainly uh, amplified by the fact that it's global. It's not just a US or a US <coughs> and Western Europe or a post-World War II. This is like a global uplift in the way that regulators, central banks, uh, market infrastructure, intermediaries like ourselves, consumers are all having to change the way that they, uh, and ta tax authorities, all changing the way that they think about the conduits of their business. Um, and at the same time, you have these emerging economies that have an incredibly large demand for much, much bigger financial infrastructure than they already have. Mm -hmm. um, but this is where I'll just mention quickly a, a, you know, kind of a reality statement about this. So a few of us uh, last year, actually as part of one of the World Economic Forum events, which was the East Asia Summit in Myanmar, I hope some of you were able to <coughs> attend that, um, a few of us were able to visit one of the larger banks uh, in Myanmar, mm -hmm. one of their main offices and branches. And uh, you know, Myanmar is a country with 60 million people, natural resources like we've never seen, strategically located between India and China with a port. I mean, it's an unbelievable story about a frontier market, but you go to the bank and primarily it seems that their business is people bringing in large piles of actual physical cash, having that cash counted, and then having that cash stored. Uh, we were taken to the credit department uh, and we were shown the loan book. Now, the loan book was actually a book. The book had about 300 or so line entries in it of actual handwritten, we lent this much money to this person and misses this and that, will repay on this date at this rate of interest. Um, so on the one hand, we talk about disruption, we talk about leapfrog, we talk about all this, but then you have these markets, and even in markets that some of us live in, where you have sophisticated financial capability, you still have an underserved population, and in some cases, and you know, we would know that in India specifically, uh, a very, very large underserved population in terms of real access to financial services. So um, you know, I hope that I live forever, or at least for a long enough time to see some of this, but I'm not sure that, uh, I'm not sure it's happening as quickly as we, we want it to. We hope you live forever, too. Thank you, that's very nice of you, Calvin. <laughs> Alan, is SWIFT a disruptor or a disruptee in all of this? Uh, I, I think certainly at this point of time, I, I, you may know that actually we are one of those uh, Stone Age animal that has been created by the financial ministry 45 years ago. And the purpose of, of the institution at the time, which is still today basically, is to making sure that financial transactions can flow seamlessly in between you know, different countries, different institutions, and, and so the same way that blood would be floating into your veins, right? And that's what we do. Now, clearly, uh, what we see nowadays, like you mentioned, for Myanmar, I can give you multiple examples, like Bangladesh, or what's happening in Africa and all that, where clearly banks haven't really evolved fast enough, especially in opening up their technology mm -hmm. to ensuring that everyone can play into the same, the same arena in terms of, of offering services to, uh, to their own customers, especially retail customers. Uh, this being said, uh, w we see that this is changing. Uh, I think, especially when we talk to our clients being our shareholders, we see clearly those people uh, changing their mind and trying to define ways in which it can be actually reinserted into, into the, 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 the business, if you like. Mm -hmm. Initiatives that are taking place, for instance, in Australia, mm -hmm. even in Singapore where I'm living, where clearly you've seen banks now developing as an industry, new payment systems that are much more seamless, completely interactive, uh, um, interactive and, so, and, and completely free. And mm -hmm. I, I'm, you know, three months ago, uh, the Singaporean community introduced a new payment system called FAST. It's, it's literally interactive. You can pay with uh, any sort of device you, you want to have. Uh, before you were paying something like 1.5 sync per transaction per payment, today is zero. So mm -hmm. that tells you also, I mean, that the banks are also reacting to the, the change that's happening. Mm -hmm. What I'd like to, to, to say also is that uh, one of the main reasons why you have all these new entrants, uh, and you, you mentioned Alipay, there are many, many more examples in, in the world. One of the main reasons is because uh, for, for many years, and, and in many instances still today, banks have kept their, their own IT environment very closed. Basically, everything is completely sealed you don't have access to all this. Mm -hmm. some, of the, some of the banks have, though, started opening up their own environment through the you know, cloud computing. Uh, you have uh, the, the, the emergence of APIs that basically enables other companies to start interacting with, with bank systems as well. Mm -hmm. So well so that you look, if you look at the context of Alipay, that's what they've done. Basically, they, they started working with all the banks, making sure that the, that the payments platform of Alipay is seamlessly interconnecting with all the bank system as well. Mm -hmm. So much so that they've started actually adding the value added services that banks are today not capable to do. 
And the problem that banks are now facing is that in doing so, if they're not reacting intelligently, is that they will be left alone with the sort of low value kind of service like the end of the day settlement, settlement whereby uh, where, where all the other platforms like Alipay and others will be able to start really working with all the data they have, the payments and all that, to bringing up much more value added service to their community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there is a ch real challenge. At the same time, I think even for the financial industry, there's still actually a, a major opportunity to, to leveraging the position that they have today. Mm -hmm. Okay, how is this playing out in Japan, which is kind of the quintessential <coughs> developed economy in this well, equation? Well, actually in Japan, uh, digital wallet is very, very popular. You know, uh, for example, myself, for the taxi, for trains, for convenience store, I don't use cash. I always use phone to mm -hmm. pay, mm -hmm. okay? So the so digital wallet or digital uh, uh, settlement is very, very big in Japan. And I think, uh, uh, I think we are moving into the new era mm -hmm. whereby, for example, the even Central Bank, uh, Bank, Bank of Japan, is now, uh, is now care, uh, Thinking about uh, you know when you calculate the money supply, those digital cash is not included into the uh, M2 the money supply. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know now we, we, we can we can we can we can't hold it. We have to we have to you know take all those into account. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we cannot really grasp what's happening in, in the economy. Mm -hmm. And also the, the the government, I mean uh, Japanese government has been had been very conservative, uh, uh, but. Uh, New, new cabinet and government are very in, innovative. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are trying to introduce uh, those uh, digital settlement uh, as uh, you know, currently it's happening just kind of outside of the, the nation. Okay? Digital settlement is more like a global uh, phenomena, not mm -hmm. like a local phenomena. Mm -hmm. okay? But uh, the settlement business has been very important business for banks. And the banks are very important for the nation because at the end of the day, the nation has to use taxpayers' money to you know, save bank. Mm -hmm. So if the settlement business is going away from the bank, it's kind of a you know, headache for the government, I think. So the, even Japanese, uh, Japanese <coughs> government now trying to, uh, how do you say, uh, address this issue to understand more about uh, this uh, digital settlement mm -hmm. and uh, try to let uh, the bank get involved mm -hmm. directly into this uh, digital settlement uh, business. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, you know, this uh, digital thing is becoming more, more, more like uh, more and more the mainstream thing for the economy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Partha, uh, a lot of uh, action expected in the banking sector in India. Yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> you know, Bunty started by saying there is a two-eyed uh, monster here. One where the digital is kind of taking pace so fast that it's leaving everything behind. On the other hand, we have people who are not even included. So inclusion is going to be a very big theme when it comes to financial development in India. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, the Prime Minister just declared that uh, over 800 million people should start having a bank account in, in, the, in the new era. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be a game where on one side it will be these people trying to catch up. And on the other side, the digital, you know, actually taking great speed. Uh, as an IT head, um, I and the CFO. Mm -hmm. You know, it's often the deadliest combination in terms of saying where I cannot say that digital and IT doesn't play a great role in finance. Mm -hmm. So it will always tend to play a very big role. And I just wanted to kind of talk about digitization here and how it's going to change the face, uh, I believe, in the next few years. So I just wanted to differentiate between digitization and digitalization. Mm -hmm. Digitization is already there in many sense that it does, every transaction gets digitized sooner than later and so will finance transactions. But what we are now talking about is digitalization where you're trying to do not just one transaction but entire ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And just let me give an example. So if a car meets with an accident, so the car then gives a message to say that the hospital is going to receive a patient with this kind of medical condition. It's going to inform the insurance company. It's going to insure the next in kin. If there is another guy involved, it's going to tell him what are all the implications for the other person in the accident. And not only that, it's going to even tell his uh, you know, children are back at home and his uh, spouse that this is what is happening. Keep the checkbook ready because you'll have to now deal in terms of some money. 
And, and that's the kind of change that we're going to see as we go forward. Mm -hmm. And this will be in IT language called business movement, because we are now going to create value through the movement because we can capture. And I kind of predict that the next war is going to be fast. who owns the business movement. Mm -hmm. And therefore, introduce a new term called PBT. We all know what it stands for, profit before tax. Mm -hmm. But in future, I think it will be known for people business and things. Mm -hmm. so, so it is going to kind of uh, look at a very new term for PBT in future. Mm -hmm. uh, and the manufacturing industry that I come from says about PPM or parts per million defects. Mm -hmm. But the new world will say people, process, and uh, things. Mm -hmm. so, so all these terminologies are going to change. And uh, as we go forward, this digital will uh, stay. And for India, uh, where it, technology is kind of got to catch up in this area, it may actually allow us to uh, leapfrog. Mm -hmm. So I'm watching this world with a great amount of things that digital is going to be the new thing. Africa, mobile banking has done a lot more. Uh, India is starting to catch up, but I hope uh, that soon people will use, uh, as uh, Oki had said, that uh, you, know, you can use phones to pay for everything in the rural India, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. now even an account is not being maintained. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's going to be fun thing. Could I follow up on of something Patra was talking about? So this concept of 800 million new account holders or, or banking the unbanked in India, I think maybe we need to expand our idea of what accounts are or, or banking and unbanked are. If you think about in China where 60% of adults have maybe traditional banking accounts, and what's happening on the new platforms. You know, if I started by just making some purchases on uh, Alibaba's Taobao, and I had some uh, excess cash on that account, and now I've used it to uh, invest into a mutual fund product, and then provide credit, trend, uh, credit history that might access a loan on the consumer finance side, you know, that's a really interesting new way to onboard uh, financial services customers. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, that is exactly actually what I, want, I, I wanted to say before, is, that, is, is, is the, 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 the slow will be the financial industry really adopting these new technologies and getting to the end banks and eventually offering them the, the possibility to eventually using the surplus they have in their accounts, investing them onto other financial services, insurance policies, or whatever the system that you have. Uh, the, the more you're going to have new entrants that, that like Alipay and others mm -hmm. into that space. Though the question also is that, I think you mentioned this, Rebecca, before, is that Oh, you mentioned this actually, is that I mean, banks uh, have, have, have faced over the last three or four years you know, a, 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 a tsunami of, of regulations, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's reality. The, the other reality is that all these companies, the Alipays, the um, you know, Alibabas, the world and all, don't yet have to face all this, this tsunami <coughs> of regulations. Mm -hmm. The more they'll get into this, the more, of course, I mean, they'll exactly. get under, under the scrutiny of the, you know, the, the PBOC in China, the FBI, and I know what it is actually to face FBI regulation in India, believe me, it's not that easy, mm -hmm. right? Because, because these, these people are responsible to making sure that the whole financial industry can still work, right? And, and that is their responsibility. Can you imagine that uh, mm -hmm. there, there would have been some disruptive technology involved into the days after Lemon went burst, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Hopefully at the time, that, you know, the, the, the central banks had put together systems that have been able to sustain the load. Mm -hmm. If the day after, none of the system would have been able to work pro right. appropriately according to the failure and option uh, um, the principle, there would have been actually any blood into the financial veins. Mm -hmm. That would have been over. That would have been actually the end of the financial systems. Simple, mm -hmm. right? So hopefully you still have these regulators that are behind there, behind the systems to making sure that uh, you know, I mean, we, the whole system still follow a certain number of rules that ultimately will defend the interest of the of the users of the of the citizens. So I'm I'm with you, but at the same time, uh, all these companies uh, sometimes will also start facing the pressure Absolutely. of the regulation. And, and and believe me, one of the key issues that banks are facing today is that and I'm supporting this regulation in a way because they they, they mm -hmm. help making the financial systems much more you know, much more sustainable mm -hmm. uh, in, in the future. But, but if uh, the only thing that they, as they have so much to invest to, you know, to, to be compliant to all this regulation, they have actually little to invest on new technologies, new services, you know, and that's the main issue that they have as well. So, so, so is that, a, is that a, a really an unfair advantage the new entrants have over the incumbents? And actually there's, a, there's you know, more broadly, there's a feeling that 
this disruption is taking hold in the emerging world versus the US and Europe because the banks there are quite frankly under a regulatory burden? Well, I think it's going to happen everywhere. You know, I think we should separate deposit and the settlement. Mm -hmm. And for the government, deposit taking entity is very important because they have to use taxpayers' money at the end of the day. Yeah. But settlement is different. So all of this, uh, you know, the digital uh, innovation happening is in this settlement side. Okay. So in, in that sense, settlement business can be totally away from banks. Right. And uh, I wonder. I, I didn't read, uh, you know, the article uh, carefully, but the iPhone, a new iPhone. Mm -hmm. Does it have a, 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 a NFC? Yeah, it does. Yes. Yeah. It has an NFC. You know, Apple will, you know, dominate the settlement. It's easy. Mm -hmm. for, at least for the individual retail mm -hmm. people uh, settlement mm -hmm. with, you know, mm -hmm. smartphone yeah. with NFC. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. If, if you don't, yeah, sorry, uh, if you don't uh, look at uh, regulation only from the Western world, and sometimes uh, uh, Reyes did mention that RBA regulations are, in a sense, very tough. And I believe this toughness comes from wanting to protect. And in, mm -hmm. in, a, in a way, yeah. it has protected when the crisis hit, that it didn't hit as much India the financial crisis because of some of these regulations which have been created. So going forward, as, you know, even as we say digital world will take by, this, uh, by storm the entire industry, the security keeping pace <coughs> is going to be a key enabler or a detractor. Mm. If there are too many frauds which happen before things settle down, and everyone may kind of start clamping down on this entire initiative. And it cannot be any more cyber security in a passive way. Mm -hmm. It has to be very much in the active way as transactions are happening. Mm -hmm. so, so clearly that, that part developing is an important <coughs> enabler to this uh, digital uh, revolution happening. Not just for settlement, uh, not, like you rightly said, more on the deposit taking side, but also for settlements. Uh, in a sense that to enable and, yeah, and that's actually I, just really quickly on that I, I I think we can't emphasize Oki's point enough because finance is a term that attracts a lot of mm -hmm. different ideas but all of them are viewed very very differently by regulators by participants right so I mean I would use a, I would use slightly different terminology but there's a transactional side which naturally or natively lends itself to the way that people behave now which right. is mobile which is connected which is you know user friendly. Um, but then there's capital formation, mm -hmm. which is <clears throat> going to have all of the same, in my opinion, legacy uh, baggage that it has forever, which mm -hmm. is that governments are going to care about what money is coming from where, the sourcing of it, and what it's being used for. Uh, industry is going to worry about you know, the, the, the macro prudential factors, and of course governments will too, and the systemic risk. Regulators are going to worry about individuals and whether their fiduciary interests are being protected, whether they're being exposed unnecessarily. <coughs> to, and this isn't new stuff. We've had tulip, you know, tulip bulbs, and we've had, right. uh, you know, Florida real estate. We've had a lot of different excess moments, uh, you know, in, in 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 time. And as we get this kind of intuitive native transaction uh, world to evolve. Like you said, there'll be residual cash left on the on the phone, or, and that'll start to become the beginning of financial uh, or capital formation, which will then start to get you into, in a way, into the older world of finance, which then is, and, and by the way, the reason, and you, I think you wouldn't disagree with this, the reason why it feels like U.S. companies or developed market uh, banks are so burdened isn't just because they're being regulated, it's also because they have large incumbencies that have been there. I mean, these, these banks and these financial institutions and these exchanges and markets are still in motion. Mm -hmm. So it's the difference between like building a new car and actually trying to change a tire and a moving one. Right, so and you I would agree that banks like Goldman um, and US European banks really face a, a big disadvantage or some strong headwinds. I think disadvantage is a strong term because what, what the implicit in that is that we're, every one of us is in exactly the same businesses or have exactly the same business model. Mm -hmm. This is a, always been a very, very segmented industry, and I think that actually technology does, as a disruptor will allow more specialization, more different participants to, to enter into the supply chain at the point where it makes the most sense. Yeah. I mean, uh, taking it away from even finance, you know, mm -hmm. it wasn't that long ago where if I was a Silicon Valley technology 
innovator, entrepreneur, I would have to think about software development in-house. I would have to think about the in technology infrastructure. I would have to think about a lot of things, and it would cost me millions, maybe tens of millions of dollars. Today, I can host it on somebody else's site. I can get somebody else to be the development core for it. There are people who ex have expertise in the user interface. There are people who have expertise in the quantitative or the data science mm -hmm. side. You know, there's, it, doesn't make the, it doesn't make the industry more, less robust. It makes it more robust because you have real specialized players in each of those uh, molecular parts of the supply mm -hmm. chain. So I'm, I'm sanguine about the future. Don't get me wrong, I'm not the Luddite, but I, I think that you know, we have to conceptualize the future as not being dominated by institutions that largely look the same, but by lots and lots of entities that look different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Africa before, and what's <clears throat> happening in Kenya is quite interesting because you have a telecom company, M-Pesa, who is the largest banker in the country, I, I think $18 billion in, um, in transactions last year, and the incumbent bank trying to get their way clawing back into this business. Mm -hmm. How likely is, is it, do you think, in, in India and in China and in, other, in Myanmar and other places around the world that we could see phone companies, um, Brazil, internet well. companies, Brazil, just unlikely entrance to the banking business really leaving mm -hmm. the, the, the industry far behind. Yeah, I mean, for if I were to talk about India, I can very clearly see that uh, one thing they have more than anything else is mobiles now. <laughs> which, <laughs> so, so it's going to be an easy way, not just of communicating, but of doing many things are along with the phone. So it's going to become a central figure and whoever will own, uh, so a telecom company can come. Right. But I'm also seeing going forward that that is going to be a view of business movements. So the, whoever is going to conquer that business movement uh, would probably have more of a say because you're just not talking about banks, then you're talking about insurance companies right. as well. You're talking about uh, the city regulations in terms of whether it is the uh, you know, traffic regulations or many things like that. Or how does a fire engine or a fire department and a police department work? So you know, where does it going to uh, kind of have deep impacts? is going to be seen, whether it's telecom company which will have everything or it will be many other people including the people not just the airwaves but are capturing the business movement, maybe IT companies have an equal chance as well going forward. So, but telecom certainly has a first mover advantage as they've seen in but Africa. But one of the biggest pools of capital in the world is the Japanese post office. So, you know, maybe on the transaction side it seems like the, the movement is one way but the reality on the other side of the equation is, is still steep in history. And I do believe that uh, governments will uh, interfere into yeah. this situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, even we separate a deposit and settlement, you know, we don't, the government doesn't, do, do not want to see the, those uh, 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 people's money to disappear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we can't just let telecom companies to do, take, take care of everything. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to, I mean, they will bring in some sort of uh, new regulations, I believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it, it's very fair to say that, uh, yeah, I mean, the, getting to that space is a very, that market is a very natural addressable market for the, all the telcos that you have uh, any other place. Mm -hmm. But the reality also is that they will be only successful if in doing so they'll be capable to start developing in, you know, in proposing additional services. I think this is one of the success of, uh, of Alipay with Alibaba is that it is a combination of a sort of superstore with a payment system as well. And the two together actually are highly successful because certainly Alibaba, uh, Alibaba yes indeed, is, is capable to leverage mm -hmm. and to, 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 to work with all the power of data they are collecting through the payments as well, which is fabulous. Now, if they don't do that, they'll get to failure as well. And, and yeah, we, we mentioned Impesa as a, an amazing success of getting, of having a telco in Kenya, uh, getting into the payments business, the sort of, uh, you know, virtual wallets and payments mm -hmm. uh, systems. Uh, in a few years, uh, grasping something like 50% of the market in the country. But then suddenly, as they were not really capable to develop value services, they start actually expanding their services or conquering other markets. They try to go to, uh, to South Africa, major failure. Mm -hmm. For the simple reason that you mentioned as well, because there they've been confronted with other regulations, right. other uh, practices and, 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 and laws in the country that made the model completely not practical in that mm -hmm. country. Mm -hmm. So I think the, 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 the way they will be expanding, the way they will be mm -hmm. actually um, proposing value-added services will, will define their success 
or no? Mm -hmm. But uh, to jump on that a little, jump off that a little bit, I think um, the interesting thing in, in the China market is that the disruptors have their own advantages as well. So you mentioned Alibaba with a kind of integrated solution yeah. for the consumer. You know, WeChat, when they really um, emerged into holding deposits and distribu distribution of digital wallets, had already grown to 300 or 400 million accounts. And so I would say um, if you think about a disruptor having to, uh, over time, migrate into a more regulated playing field, somebody who has that depth of customer relationship and profitability, frankly, is well positioned to work with the government. And as long as they're creating incremental value for those consumers from a perspective of, you know, this is a business that three or 400 million people want to still see exist, then I think there's a conversation with regulators that can be actually, you know, win-win. Uh, and, 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 and I can also build on upon <coughs> what you said when it comes to regulators. Ultimately, you, you mentioned this as well, that several of time regulators and governments will step into the, mm -hmm. the arena as well for the simple reason that they need to protect the interests of their citizens, right? Yeah. And, and the best example of this is what is happening those days in Bangladesh, where, where they, the, Mr. Brahman, the, the so-called green banker, the, the governor of the central bank has actually got, uh, uh, has reforced the, the banks to create a new payment system, a rural payment system for, for the people who do not have access to anything, with the only difference that the central bank will propose its guarantee to those deposits, mm -hmm. which is making a, a very strong difference to you know, what is happening in other countries. So the central bank will be there really to protecting you know, the interests mm -hmm. of citizens. Yeah. So you're concerned about risk. Let's tackle that um, about in, in some of these countries where there's non-traditional players, short of what is happening in Bangladesh, you're worried that some of these non-traditional players could be adding risk to, to the system, particularly if there's I, I, a problem I'm, and and suddenly there's no regulation, there's no rules to, to really dictate what happens. For, for me, there are clearly risks that, that belongs to the, the sphere, right, which is about protecting the interests of the ones actually that have the deposit on bank accounts and all that. But you have also many of the risks that, that, that belongs to the way that those services would be proposed to the end customers, with the technology that stands behind this, uh, the networking side, uh, cyber crime. I mean, it's fine to take about, you know, to, uh, like we have 212 countries in the world and, and 11,000 institutions but you need to make sure that all of that is actually mm -hmm. really secured, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you can read in the press, right? Go every day in the press, you see leakings, right? You see, you know, every other day, 30 million there, 45 million there, that are being basically stolen by people that have a specialty, especially if you're coming from some countries, to hacking and getting to the system. Mm -hmm. So if you're not, um, uh, if you're not proposing a, a system to the people that, are, that, that, that is really, uh, uh, secured from a protection, protections point of view to the people, but also from a technology and access point of view, you're going to have some issues. Mm -hmm. So, But I would say that regulators... That sounds a bit like an argument of an incumbent, though. Well, let's say, <laughs> you know, without risk, there's no re reward, right? Sorry. So ultimately, I think there may be another obligation for regulators, which is, are these new technologies, are these disruptions net positive for industry, for individuals, consumers? Yeah. And I think if we had the burden of not just protection, but of actually creating value, then I think we should see you know, some risk, managed risk, um, that can keep the robust or unfragile system in place, but has to let new, new opportunities emerge. That, I, I couldn't possibly disagree with that statement, but that debate will oscillate. Mm -hmm. There'll be moments in time, just like, you know, financial deregulation, derivative mm -hmm. deregulation, where everybody thinks distribution of risk is great and it's creating engines, you know, to power economies and leverage is safe because we're much smarter. We have, you know, great PhDs from MIT working on this stuff. <laughs> and then instantaneously overnight, you know, it's too big to fail, moral hazard, banks are too big, financial leverage is too concentrated, it's, it, and it's too, it's too concentrated on the one hand, it's too distributed on the other hand because we can't find it. So should we mediate the oscillation and try to make I, it smaller then, or? I mean, look, atoms vibrate since the Big Bang, and I think the conversations <laughs> that are policy-driven will vibrate uh, you know, just as long as atoms vibrate. So I don't think that there's a, a way to stabilize that conversation. I think that there'll be some trial and error, but I, I think what I would argue for, and I think there seems to be like at least some part of the room that, that, that feels this way, is that as, <laughs> as these, as these interfer interfering technologies or, or new sticky ways to access financial services, transaction, start to look more like sources of financial risk, financial exposure, mm -hmm. um, that where 
governments might be expected implicitly to underwrite that risk over time, people are going to start paying attention. And the moment you have a crisis, people are really going to start paying attention. Yeah. So I, I don't think that it's yeah. impossible yeah. to foresee that. Arthur. Let me just give you a contra view. We tried to say whether we should apply for the new banking regulation, you know, new bank we were to apply for in India. And then we did this calculation saying I have to keep so much money for SLR, which is, you know, keeping money with the government and doing this. And for the next 10 years, we probably will make lesser money than we'll make as a, a non-NBFC that we are, a non-banking financial institution. Mm. So this is all is happening because of the regulation which wants to protect. If you overlay the regulations to all the people who are holding money and they are asked to prescribe to the same thing, then the attractiveness that is in terms of a financial standpoint will come down dramatically. Mm -hmm. Then the rubber will actually hit the road. Mm -hmm. And then they will say whether specialization wins the game in that era or it is going to be these people who will try to manage both the selling as well as keeping money intact. So is going to win. It's, it's going to be an important factor. And I, I think so far as the regulation is not there and only convenience is there, it's fine. But the moment you overlay regulation and they have to manage all that regulation, you know, which is one of the biggest uh, problems that any bank faces, how to manage these regulations mm -hmm. and be on the right side always. Mm -hmm. So I think, so I think it's an important consideration. That's a good point. Okay. Uh, well, well regu the, you're predicting this fight over regulation no, no, no. and more of it and won't it slow things down then? I have a, I have a new idea. Okay. <laughs> so maybe the regula regulators, governments uh, may or should uh, let banks do everything. Everything? Yeah, I mean, so far, you know, the, the regulators have been very protective, prote protecting banks so that the banks cannot do you know, banks cannot do the, the merchandising or, you know, gaming, those kind of things. Let banks to do that, you know. To get the, into gaming. The gaming or, you know, <laughs> you know <laughs> like, uh, you, know, <laughs> you know, Amazon type of business, <laughs> whatever, and the banks has the banks got the capital. banks get bigger and bigger then. Yeah, so that's another way to, you know, somehow balance the... Right. So, right. so as Amazon so, so, brings the fight to the banks, then they should bring bank? it back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, look, it's a little late to put new panelists on, but if we had a retailer, <laughs> if we had a tele telecom company, if we had a technology-oriented platform uh, representative here, my guess, I don't know, but my guess is that they don't necessarily want to be banks. They're thinking about offering financial services as a way to make their telecom or their device business much more attractive. Or they're thinking of yeah. financial access as a way to power their retail or their merchandise in the same way that, I mean, we represent financial entities here. I don't think any of us want to necessarily become telecom companies or become you know, merchandise, even if we had the opportunity. Because again, there's a natural skill set or core culture, your corporate culture and, and customer base that makes sense for us to you know, expand and, 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 and cultivate. Uh, and, but it may not be that smart, I mean, just as a, a for-profit enterprise to try to branch too far. But it's not only services. You know, the, uh, there are so much of uh, uh, settlements, payment, going, you know, happening in those, uh, you know, Amazon or those places. And they are paying, or their clients are paying a lot of fee to banks. So if they take all things Fair enough. inside, then, you know, they make, they make a lot of money. I think you're identifying the nature of convergence, <laughs> what's happening there. Yeah. I'd love there's, to... As one said, there's two ways to make money, bundling and unbundling. <laughs> I'd love to open up this discussion to the audience. If any of you have questions, we could go on. Um, Disagreement. <laughs> yes. Um, my name is Max Monkey. I'm the head of the Microphone, please. My question is actually, what do you see as the impact of virtual currencies on payments, such as Bitcoin and other? Do you see this as just a flash in the pan? Thank you. Anyone want to grab that? I, I would say um, I am a huge believer in cryptocurrencies, um, not just for transactions and not necessarily just Bitcoin, but I think the invention of the open uh, ledger with the uh, blockchain is fundamentally really technically exciting. And I think whether it is for transaction of value or whether it is for traceability of digital assets, I think this invention is going to affect in fact and affect financial services, not just on the transaction side, uh, 
in, in the settlement side, but also on the capital formation side too. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think, uh, you know, I do believe that Bitcoin and those kind of things are very good. Um, but again, the government will step in. For example, you know, uh, this is what I'm th uh, I think. The, the uh, US government, you know, the biggest uh, treasury, biggest government in, in the world, they do love greenbacks <laughs> that are cash. You know why? Those, you know, they, they print money, mm -hmm. and once those money go to the, uh, you know, weapon business or drug business, or wherever, those money will never come back to treasury. Mm -hmm. So it's like a debt equity, debt equity swap, it, yeah. right? So they, they issue paper as a debt, that now it, it will become equity. So if the digital cash take over the real cash, then the U.S. government cannot enjoy those kind of things, mm -hmm. okay? So I believe the government, like the U.S. government, and the big government will step in to somehow stop, or, you know, to those uh, digital cash but, to become but too But so large. is it stop or regulate? So I think there's an opportunity to regulate this technology, as mm -hmm. is already happening in many jurisdictions, but I don't think you can stop it. Mm -hmm. I, China you, tried to stop it. Uh, actually, 70% of transaction volumes in Bitcoin's exchange are RMB denominated. So it's not being oh. stopped. Mm. So I, I, this is not an area of expertise at all, but you know, if I think in a parallel old-fashioned universe where if there's an independent Scotland, we don't even know exactly how to think intelligently <laughs> about what the currency implications are. I, I mean, at what, what does it mean for a currency that doesn't have a nation state or doesn't have a sort of sovereign sponsor, and what, what are the implications there? And again, it goes back to the same thing. That, you know, when it gets important, people start to care. When people start to care, the discussion really begins. Mm -hmm. yeah. Alan, but, how would SWIFT handle Bitcoin? I think I'm, I'm very much with, with, <laughs> with, uh, with you on this one. I think from a, from, a, from a design architecture point of view, I think the Bitcoin approach, whether you call it, you call it Bitcoin or something else, there, may, there, there would be others, by the way, I'm, I'm sure, using the, the same sort of uh, approach to market is a, is a good thing. Uh, but again, I mean, uh, I think the, the more it will be spread, spread over in different markets, the more the more regulators, uh, governments will, will start actually influencing this, or at least controlling what's the, the, the way it's being done. Mm -hmm. But frankly, if you look at the way it is done, it is a much more efficient way to dealing with currencies than right. the ones we have today, right? Yeah, that's, that's the reality. If you look at the from a from an architectural point of view, yep. it's much more efficient. Mm -hmm. and, no. and and another irony is, you know, Bitcoin got a bad reputation because of Silk Road and illicit activities transacting with Bitcoin, yeah. but fundamentally, with an open ledger you could have nothing more transparent and traceable. Yeah, but then from there, you'll get to all sorts of discussions about it. That's why government, governments will step in or regulators because you have all sorts of issues around national debts, about uh, sovereignty. Mm -hmm. I mean, currency is like uh, the, the one thing that states have. Huh? It's like I have the dollar, I have the euro, whatever, but that's something that I have. Mm -hmm. And that shows the strength of your, of your country or your people. Mm -hmm. Part that Bitcoin yeah, in India, yeah. it could Bitcoin, be the answer. Yeah, in terms of cost. What is the cost structure of a Bitcoin-like operations versus the hard currency method that we have? Mm -hmm. And if eventually productivity and the cost of transaction has to win over, Bitcoin has a place in the world. Yeah? Uh, and some of these will, will go through much as, you know, problems as you have defined, because governments will try to hold. So I think of this not as a general uh, answer to everything, but as a niche area, uh, which will do in certain areas very well. While government will try to kind of control bits of it, which it wants to still have the green, green bucks and feel their money in the hand. Mm -hmm. so, so I think mm -hmm. that will coexist, but there will be a place for a, uh, something like Bitcoin, even in India. Any other questions? There's one behind you. Thank you. Hi. A lot of this conversation uh, around digital currency has been about digital currency as store of value. But I think where the real kind of revolution will be coming from, it will not be with uh, these digital currencies as a store of value precisely because of reasons that you gave, but more on the application of the technology, which as Kelvin very well pointed out, that the open ledger on the blockchain, once we start applying it to settlement systems, clearing systems, this is, I think, where we will start seeing a lot of disruption and actually, not, not for the bad, also for, for, for the better, precisely because it can also increase not only efficiency, but also transparency of uh, tra interactions and transactions in financial markets. Mm -hmm. Any response to that? In Japan, is this the, the, disru 
the life you mentioned, the wallet yeah. expanding, is that disrupting or is it, is it kind of preserving the status quo? It's expanding with a good harmony. Mm, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you it know, doesn't strike I, me I, as a disruptive force. Well, again, you know, the, the currency is a very big business for the government. Mm -hmm. we, we have to remember. So as, as you said, you know, as long as it's niche, fine. But once it becomes too big, you know, the government will step in. So I think we have to. I mean, you know, I'm not in the government, OK? <laughs> I'm in the business. I love, I love Bitcoin. I love uh, digital cash. We have to be careful. We, we, should, we should keep this thing as uh, not too big, just convenient, and then enjoy the, you know, the transparency and uh, you know, traceability or convenience or whatever. But I think with any new and powerful technology, there may be a tendency to think of how do we mitigate the risk by keeping it small or keeping it niche. We might have said the same thing about the internet. And yet, these powerful new technologies, they have a way of getting right. beyond our control. I agree mm -hmm. with that. Yeah. You're right. One thing that I'd like to, to come to, uh, one point you mentioned in your question is about the port of transparency. Uh, of the payment systems, so the clearing, settlements, and all that. As far as I'm concerned, I th what I believe is that there is nothing more transparent than that, actually. If you, if you look at all the major payment systems in the world, when it comes to the Fed, uh, uh, Fedwire, you go to the ECB, the Euro systems, you go to uh, the BOG uh, payment system, all, all of those actually are very much transparent. Actually, you're really capable to, tra to trace any sort of payments that you have in the country. Banks, national banks are publishing actually, you know, amounts of payments, uh, you know, uh, a number of payments, amounts of payments, and all that every, every other week. I mean, they, they do that. I have some questions about the transparency of the Bitcoin system those days. I mean, that, that don't believe that they are that much transparent. Mm. Uh, so, so I think we need to be careful about what we're talking about because what happened recently with Bitcoin, it for me, is far from being transparent. Far from being transparent. Mm. And, and also, we should, re we should remember that there are always some, some people who don't like transparency. <laughs> this will continue forever, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One thing that we haven't touched on much is, is the role of reform. And when you look at Alibaba, Jack Ma uh, said he'd like to stir things up in the financial sector. Mm -hmm. And one has to think that part of what is happening here in China is that the government is perhaps using Alibaba and other companies to reform the banks. So we've talked a lot about risk, but, but can governments kind of strategically use these players to force change? <laughs> it's a, 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 a very political question, I suppose, if you allow me to project intention of the government in this industry. Um, I would say, you know, from my previous experience in, in online lending and peer-to-peer -peer finance, um, the regulators and uh, governance in China is actually very strategic, very sophisticated, sophisticated, very technically astute. And while I wouldn't say that this would be a, a, a weapon or a tool to encourage reform. I think um, they certainly would see and want to balance um, the opportunity of letting new entrants force a little bit of change. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm sure they're seeing the costs and benefits and the trade-offs of it, if not saying, hey, Jack, why don't you come mix things up a little bit? <laughs> Partha, do you think that will happen in India? Will we? Yeah. see a kind of managed mix of new and old as we bank those 600 million people? Yeah. If IT is one example of how things have transformed in India, when you jumped in and started using that as a mean of you know, livelihood, we're not seeing the big workstations ever. Yeah. And still, you, know, you adapted it, the entire <coughs> ecosystem adapted it, new laws came in. I think technology as a way of getting and persuading many people because of the benefit it gives to the entire ecosystem. And government may need not be persuaded by applications, but we can be persuaded by uh, benefits that it brings in. And I think we all cannot deny the benefits of these things. So eventually, yes, it will come. But just remember one thing in the financial world which doesn't apply to anything else, that you are trading with millions of people's money. And that is where the, it is not just about being in the sector. If another US kind of crisis comes in the financial sector, and that comes because this kind of non-regulated industry, 
just look at the kind of uh, you know harm it could do and that's why the security piece is so important for this to become mainframe mm -hmm. yeah it, and we need to look at that not as a means of stopping somebody but as a checks and balances which is more appropriate in financial industry than in any other industry mm -hmm. which is that. Because you are playing with retail people's money. That's, that's at the end of the day, that's the game. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, it's, it's actually how much fast the government can bring sec security and regulation to manage this. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, government will have to step in eventually. But then, this is not even regulated. Mm -hmm. so, so that's, that's the trade-off one mm -hmm. has to say. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Robert Milliner from Australia. Could uh, I just like you to um, focus a bit more on the inherent conundrum here? A number of speakers have touched on it about obviously from a user point of view, users want to use the full intent of technology and develop this and to make it user friendly. And user uh, preferences are global, but money and government's responsibility are country specific. And so I see the, the large conundrum here is mm. about the whole movement here is around using this to facilitate uh, ease of use and a global ease of use, which has a lot to be commended to it. But ultimately, responsibilities of government come back to a country defined characteristic. And you can see that in the debate around taxes mm -hmm. uh, and the way in which um, the perception that companies are moving taxes, which are the property of their citizens, to other countries. And so if you move that risk, and, and we can talk about allocation of risk and keep talking about that for a long time, <laughs> but ultimately I think, as you said, Barrow, countries will have to make a decision on that. And so the issue here is not so much what's the potential, is how do you resolve that conundrum? Yep. Does anyone want to tackle that? We're still acting locally in many instances. <laughs> well, I think that... <clears throat> I think you did a really elegant job of articulating the two things. You know, I, I remind some of my colleagues in different contexts that we're never going to hire somebody ever again and likely never get a new client that didn't grow up with the internet and a mobile phone. Right? Mm -hmm. So we have to, to your point, preferences and how people act are you know, inc increasingly becoming more uniform. Um, but you said acting locally. The local here, by definition, starts to become global. Right? A tax authority starts to enforce uh, their pers perspective in protecting their interests uh, mm -hmm. or, or financial regulator or prudential regulator. Um, and then that can have implications. These are in, often times are multinational companies or they are more multi-jurisdictional in their activities. And then that in and of itself creates a global uh, ripple. And uh, I mean, we see that with regulators. We see that, you know, with tax authorities. And, you know, maybe it feels a little bit like it's coming from west to east because the, the genesis of it might be a little crisis driven, um, meaning global financial crisis right. driven, uh, and you're seeing some copycat regulation or upregulation to offset. Um, but I, I don't think that there's I don't I don't think that those preferences are going to be able to evolve away from the sovereign interests playing a, a, a big uh, a big role because the, the sovereign interests are this, that's the tidal pattern that's the ocean moving up and down and the direction. Of, uh, of the current, um, you know, the rest of it. We're just tacking along in the wind to some extent. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I don't have an answer for you, but I think that that conundrum is very vivid right now and getting more so. Mm -hmm. Alan, isn't SWIFT an attempt the, to do just that, to, to globalize finance? But, but clearly, I mean, uh, I think your point is very right. I mean, what we see today, and being uh, operational actually in 212 countries in the world, is that every single country has its own set of regulations, <coughs> laws, and all that. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that most of the case, they're different. Even when it gets actually to the European community where you have 27 countries and, and 18 on the Eurozone, yes, they still have, they have the sort of European regulation in addition actually to the, still the, the, the national uh, jurisdictions and, and, and laws as well. Now, we shouldn't also forget that above and beyond this, you have also countries that have no extraterritorial legislation, like the US. So you need to make sure that you know, when you're a bank or when you are a financial supplier, that you not only comply to every single jurisdiction where you have local operations, but also in addition to that, the one that somewhere I mean, is superseding all the other ones. And that, that makes actually the, you know, the, 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 the real difficulties and the challenge for, for all the players you have in there. And I would suspect that the more, uh, again, I'm coming back to that example, Nari Pay or other players, 
will, will go abroad, will start really developing the international business, the more they will, they will be confronted with that as well. Exactly. Uh, you know, I, I can imagine, right, it's perhaps like a, a, a sort of a five years down the road scenario, but you know, the Apple stuff, right? They, they start actually proposing payment services in all the countries. Certainly, American citizens that today do not want to, really part, to be part of reporting to the American administration, like you have an increasing mm -hmm. number of them in those countries, they're making payments through Apple, uh, Apple Pay, go straight to the US, up, oh, then you know, the, the American administration has a view on this, and God knows what's gonna happen. So, you know, transparency is, is gonna be critical into that as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the other side of that, which is privacy. And privacy, yes, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, any other questions before we wrap up? I want to ask about the relation between financial sector and the industrial companies. So are you recruiting more people from uh, those uh, industrial companies who have rich experience in his uh, specific industry, not only financial bankers? And the second is, are you, do you feel that the and um, financial sector and uh, industrial companies are emerged together closely than before. Thank you. Well, 80% of new hires of my company globally are engineers. Mm. Wow. So I think, uh, you know, by the way, the number of engineers are really drying up. Mm -hmm. In the States, really drying up. Mm -hmm. I mean, China is very clever, producing, uh, you know, many, many engineers. So I think to produce engineers are going to be very important for, mm -hmm. for, the, uh, for the nation, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. And answering your question, I think uh, you know, those engineering and finance are getting very, very close to each other, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Before we wrap up, I'd love to uh, just go around the circle and see uh, what your predictions might be for, for how this will end up in the next um, three to five years. Mm -hmm. More inclusion is a, is a word that I can hear. Not just of more people participating, but also technology participating in the game. Mm -hmm. that's, that's how I see it going. With the government slowly uh, using security as a mean of comforting themselves, but operating in niches. Mm -hmm. that's, how, that's how I see the world going in the next three to five years. Okay. I think it will change, uh, definitely. But uh, when you think about uh, the vested interest, around the, this currency or settlement, I think it has to move slow. Mm -hmm. It will move slowly uh, compared to other innovations, mm -hmm. I think. So not as fast as one might think. Mm. Well, I, I'm pretty sure that, uh, well, of course, I mean, technology will, will keep evolving uh, faster than ever and then will keep accelerating and again and again. I think the financial industry will have to, to keep adapting to that, but I'm, I'm with you as well. I mean, whilst you're gonna have many more people, the unbanked, Getting to you know, getting bank uh, banked and all that, uh, th there will be there will be a lot more interest and national interest, uh, you know, you know, getting involved into into the, the definition of, or the future of that industry. Yeah, well, I guess it's appropriate. Calvin gets the last word. You don't want to end on a grumpy <laughs> a grumpy note like me, but uh, I, you know, I'll, I'll borrow some I'll borrow some words from smarter, more thoughtful people than me. You know, William Gibson, the famous futurist author, kind of saw the the internet in some ways, he, he said, and I think it was something along the lines of, you know, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's that inevitability that, you know, we're, we're seeing tomorrow or today, um, but that doesn't mean we're seeing tomorrow everywhere today, uh, because in a lot of places we haven't even, we can barely see yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, <laughs> one of my favorite uh, thought, thought leaders on this topic is, uh, on, on all topics, is Mark Twain. And he said, you know, history never repeats itself, but it rhymes. And so, you know, while the future might be here and is working its way through the distribution, you know, we shouldn't assume that the history will have no resemblance to the past. Mm -hmm. Calvin. I, I'd echo a lot of the comments. I think over the next five years, we definitely will see upregulation and some slowing of the emergence in, um, let's say, uh, distribution, uh, however unevenly, of some of these new exciting technologies. I would say inclusion is a really exciting topic from the unbanked, from the, say, base of the pyramid. But just to end on another maybe lighter note, one aspect of inclusion we haven't added yet is artificial intelligence. And I think one of the exciting aspects of cryptocurrency is machine to machine transaction. Yeah. And I think that's something we're gonna see emerge uh, over the next few years too. With that, please join me in thanking the panelists for a fascinating discussion. Thank you. Thank you.